Welcome again. Today we look at topic 9.2 for IV biology, transporting the flow. Last time we were looking at topic 9.1 and we looked at how water comes up from the soil through the, the xylem using cohesion, adhesion, and capillarity. We also considered how fungi work in a symbiotic relationship to help roots have a greater reach for mineral ions. Today, we are moving on to look at transport in the flow. And if we were to make a transverse section like this here, cut down across the root like, like this, and then look down this way into the root, you will see that for a dicot plant or for a typical flowering plant, the phloem is on the outside and the xylem is on the inside. There's just a thin layer of cells that separates the phloem and the xylem. But the phloem being more on the outside of the stem and the xylem more on the inside. In the leaf of a flowering plant, photosynthesis occurs where carbon dioxide combines with water which is taken up from the xylem and glucose is made. And here I represent glucose by a hexagon because glucose contains six carbon atoms. Glucose is made in leaves or in sources. That glucose is not transported to other parts of the plant that need glucose as glucose, but it's built up into sucrose. An anabolic process is one where components come together to build something up. And sucrose is made up of two six carbon sugars, but when you combine them, you get formula for sucrose of C12H22O11. Plants convert glucose into sucrose because it is more efficient to transport sugars as sucrose because sucrose is less reactive than glucose. So this area where the glucose is made and converted to sucrose is referred to as the source. And then the plant needs to get all of this sugar from the source down to the sink. And by the time we're finished explaining how it happens, you might wonder where did we get this evidence from? From two places. One experiment involving aphid styles. So what is an aphid? It's a tiny green insect, a lot smaller than what you see here on this image. It can fit in the middle of your finger and it will just be a tiny green speck. So it's something that if you don't know what it is, then you might never pay any attention to it. But now that you know what it is, you might find yourself seeing an aphid sometime soon. And an aphid has the ability to put its mouth part or its stylet straight into the phloem vessel, and then you give it an anesthetic, and you cut off the stylet and leave the stylet in there. In time, sugar will begin to come out of the stylet and you can actually measure the rate of flow. This has also been used to extract sap and to get samples where you can look at the composition. So by allowing aphids to put their stylets in there, it's possible to figure out that close to the source, the rate of flow would be higher. And down at the sink, the rate of flow would be low. Another source of evidence is by using radioactive labeling. Taking the formula of sucrose C12 H22 O11. It contains 12 carbon atoms and carbon atoms usually have six protons and six neutrons but a radioactive form of carbon has six protons and eight neutrons and this radioactive element can be traced with a device called a Geiger counter. So if you were to make radioactive carbon dioxide and allow plants to use that radioactive carbon dioxide. Then they would use it, and that radioactivity would go into glucose, which is the product, and then that radioactivity would go into sucrose, which is built up, and then you would be able to trace where this radioactive element is going from source to sink. So these are two sources of evidence to support the mechanism that we speak about, or the, the way that sugars get transported in the flow. So now let's go in and take a closer look at how sugars are transported in the flow. This explanation applies 
specifically to angiospermophytes or the flowering plants. In these plants, photosynthesis occurs in the leaves. Sucrose is the form in which sugar is transported out of these areas of production or sources to areas that need sucrose or sinks. This movement of sucrose from a source to a sink happens through a system of tubes known as the phloem. The phloem runs very close to the xylem, the system that takes water up from the soil. The xylem and the phloem are very close by to each other, separated by a thin layer of cells known as the cambium. This diagram is very useful in understanding how sucrose moves from the source to sink. And here you can see the schematic representing the phloem with the cross walls having tiny openings or perforations. And this is known as the sieve plate. Sucrose is made in these leaf cells. And what follows is known as phloem loading as a large amount of sugar collects here at the top of the phloem. And when the sucrose concentration in this area becomes very high, then water would move by osmosis from an area of a dilute solution or where you have more water molecules to where you have less water molecules, moving down a natural diffusion gradient. And as the water molecules move in and exert their hydrostatic pressure on the walls of the phloem, then there is a natural tendency, very much like water gushing along a hose, for sugars and water to move and to flow from this area of high pressure to areas of lower pressure. Eventually, the sugars arrive at cells that have very low sucrose concentrations. And then sucrose diffuses across a natural gradient from where you have more to where you have less. What you end up with is a very dilute solution at this point, which can naturally diffuse back to the transpiration stream, this natural flow that is occurring from the root up to the leaves. But one of the key areas to understand is exactly how does the phloem get loaded? Because it requires the movement of sugar or sucrose from an area of relatively low concentration to an area of relatively high concentration. In other words, it requires movement against a concentration gradient. And for this movement against a concentration gradient to happen in a living system, then energy needs to be expended from that living system. In this case, the energy comes from the hydrolysis of ATP. And to understand the mechanism or exactly how this happens, we need to consider the structure of the cell membrane. And if we now focus our attention specifically on the structure of the cell membrane with this area here representing the outside of the cell and this area representing the inside of the cell. And because this is a fairly recent discovery in plant science, there does tend to be some ambiguity in various textbooks. But to put it simply, we can describe this whole process as one which involves the use of hydrogen ion sucrose symporter. And what that means is that ATP, adenosine triphosphate, is hydrolyzed to become ADP and to release a phosphate. And as it does this, it associates with a transmembrane protein which acts as a catalyst for the process. And as this happens, hydrogen ions are forced out of the cell, building up a high amount on the outside of the cell. Next, the hydrogen ions move in through another transmembrane protein. And here, this process is associated with moving sucrose against its concentration gradient. And this fairly complicated process can be described simply 
as involving a hydrogen ion sucrose sim porter. Sim, which means together. So the hydrogen ions and the sucrose move in together. The fact that ATP has to be hydrolyzed to create this buildup of hydrogens, which is then connected to the import of sucrose, means that the process itself would not occur unless ATP is consumed, meaning that the uploading of sucrose from an area of low concentration outside of the cell to an area of high concentration, this movement against a concentration gradient would not happen unless ATP is consumed. So we can say that the phloem is loaded by a hydrogen ion sucrose symporter.